Part 2, Chapter 2, Friends, Enemies, Neutrals, and Trust. If you know your enemy and know yourself, you can win many battles without loss. If you only know yourself but not your enemy, you may win or you may lose. If you know neither yourself nor your enemy, you will always pay the price. It is imperative that we have solid definitions when it comes to who we can and who we cannot trust. Networks of saboteurs must be secure in order to succeed, and they can only be as secure as the local individual saboteur is secure. That can only be achieved through careful and thorough vetting of our network of friends and supporters. In above-ground activism, suspicions and paranoia can be divisive and can harm a movement. But, in an underground movement, focusing on activities that can land the individual in a government cage or worse, there is no such thing as being too careful. We can allow no deviation of principles, no questionable characters, and whenever possible, no means of compromising the individual in their private lives. That is not to say that every friend saboteur be a perfect angelic being. It does mean that every reasonable effort must be made to ensure that the underground network is safe from infiltrators, the incompetent, the desperate, the loudmouth, the big shot, and short-thinking emotional reactionaries. As the old saying goes, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and the shorter that chain, the less likely it is to have a weak link. Local friend saboteurs are safest when they work alone. Working with one more saboteur doubles the likelihood of detection, and adding a third friend to the group triples the chances. It can be argued that many hands make the task light, but when it comes to trust, the smaller the circle, the better. Saboteur networks should be distributed networks with each friend saboteur connected to several others without any being dependent on a central organization. The network should not depend on one universal method of communication. For example, some can connect through a secure internet chat, while others can talk at physical meeting places and physical drop points, and others can connect through secure network-only telephones, not carrier-based telephone systems, but dedicated secure networks using dedicated network-only portable phones. In any event, meetings of medium to large groups should be discouraged, and any form of open communication should be through selective non-specific wording and code words. For example, rather than referring to a friend saboteur by name, describe him by some other means such as, our friend with the little brown dog. And rather than saying, I have hacked into the police chief's computer, one could say, that one fat pig left his back door open, so I took a look around. As silly and cartoonish as these examples may sound, they are time-tested methods, and the more a crew of activists uses them, the better they will get at being very specific while staying incredibly vague. In other words, this method works. Chapter 2.1 Friends. The fool chases colorful butterfly, the wise man paints himself in the dull colors of the forest, and quietly waits for the stag that will feed his family. Trusted friends of freedom must be enemies of slavery, enemies of aggression, and enemies of all who would steal from us, cage us, and kill us. The friend of freedom can make no excuse for collectivism and government domination. The friend of freedom is not a nationalist, a racist, a bigot, nor any other form of collectivist who would seek to judge his fellow man based on anything other than the man himself. The friend of freedom is a true abolitionist and a voluntarist. He doesn't pick and choose what rights the government should grant or protect. The friend of freedom knows that government can only suppress rights, and it can give nothing to anyone unless it stole from someone else first. The friend of freedom should express to the world his unique brand of liberty primarily through his own deeds and secondarily through his words. The friend of freedom's life, in and of itself, should be an act of witness, and evangelism should be an afterthought if it is to be engaged in at all. After all, freedom is the natural condition of humanity. It is our default setting. Freedom needs no outlandish televangelists. In actuality, freedom is the enemy of the religion of statism, but it is not a competing religion, and it needs no phony hucksters selling it for the price of a donation. The vast majority of friends of freedom will be content to seek their own freedom in their own life through avoiding government agents or attempting to get along as best as they can with the system we currently have. They don't like the system, but many feel there is little if anything they can do about it. They have families and busy lives, and their primary goal is to survive, and we wish them well. Some will be driven to speak out in some way or express their frustration with the current system through writing or public speaking or through some other peaceful activism. We need these activists, and we honestly do wish them well. However, there will be some of these friends who will not be content to avoid conflict. There will be some who will possess a fire burning inside them, and that fire will seek a different path. From this last group, we must carefully select our friends' saboteurs and teach them of our mission. From this radical group, the Legos will be spread across the carpet in anticipation of that movement. Then, in the middle of the night, the state will encounter that immovable object, and the state will be revealed, not as an omnipotent god, but as fragile and weak, crumbling to its knees for all to see. This we will do. Chapter 2. 
1.1. There are friends, and then there are friends. Friend saboteurs are a very special type of anarchist. For most peaceful anarchists, the thought of actively and intentionally damaging property or personally targeting individuals is not what they have come to know as acceptable behavior. The vast majority of them will object to our type of activism. Some will be so offended that they may present a threat of exposure to the friend saboteur. Because of this gap in understanding, it should not be the role of the saboteur to recruit for the cause of simple sabotage. Rather, we should let nature take its course and allow friend saboteurs to develop at their own speed as weeds in the garden of the state. Then, when we are relatively sure of their intentions, it is best if a non-saboteur friend approaches them with something like this manual or other material introducing the concept. There is a role for every like-minded person as a friend saboteur. However, ideally, the perfect friend saboteur will not be burdened by a family members that the government can arrest and use as leverage against him. He will not be the outspoken radical known for his objections to the state. He will not be the confrontational anarchist with an arrest record for activism, 420 slogans on his shirt, neon blue dreadlocks, and a triple zero gauge nose piercing. He will not have a bumper sticker on his car that reads, Bad pig, no donut, or end welfare abuse, shoot a pig. In short, the ideal friend saboteur will look like the teller at your bank, the head nurse on the cardiac floor, or the friendly local package delivery driver on the brown truck. Each of these stealth anarchists are worth more than an army of angry adult children dressed in black setting trash cans on fire and throwing rocks at cops. Each dedicated stealth anarchist, friend saboteur, is worth a hundred legions of video warriors asking strangers on the street about the value of silver so they can laugh at the uneducated while pumping up their view count on social media. In short, the ideal friend saboteur should be invisible to the state, ingenious in action, wise in discretion, and long on patience. But few of us are perfect. Sometimes wisdom and patience can win the day all by themselves. Chapter 2.2 Enemies The enemy of my enemy may well be a far more dangerous enemy. Chapter 2.2.1 The Great Enemy of Humanity To be ignorant of what happened before you were born is to remain forever a child. To understand the state, you could think in terms of theology and mythology. The state would appear to be the unholy trinity of governments, select corporations, and central banking, served by their demonic lackeys, the media, entertainment, circuses, select clergy, and select intelligentsia. In fact, these are the idols, the temples, the priests, and the tools of the state, not the state itself. The state, whether real or imagined, is the deity in the minds of humans that inspires those humans to behave in a way that supports and perpetuates the above-stated trinity and its ghoulish angels. The state would be easily killed if it were simply a government or a bank. But it is not that. It dwells in the minds of countless actors worldwide, and it constantly shifts, morphs, and mutates in order to maintain its existence and dominance. Today, corporations control governments, and banks control corporations, but this relationship is fluid. Tomorrow, the clergy may be back on top, or governments could regain preeminence. The pecking order doesn't matter, only the beast matters, and it dwells in the hearts of men, not in the institutions. Another way of viewing our enemy the state is by considering the study of memetics under a Dawkinsian interpretation. In this view, the state is an inorganic being, a unit of culture rather than a unit of carbon, that lives in the human minds and leaps from human to human as a form of reproduction. Like a virus, memes can range from harmless or a mild irritant to a deadly infliction without cure. Also, much like a virus, some humans appear to be immune or resistant to particular memes, while some have no resistance at all. In the case of the state, if you consider the incredible body count amassed during its current incarnation, roughly from 1600 CE, the birth of corporations and modern banking, to present, it would rank as the most deadly virus ever known to infect humans. However, unlike a virus, a meme in this case, the state, can cause an infected human or humans to kill non-infected humans in massive numbers. Some estimates exceed 250 million deaths just by governments during the 20th century alone, and that staggering number doesn't include war. Read that again. 250 million people murdered by governments in 100 years, and that doesn't include war. This is our enemy. Whether a deity or a meme, the state exists in the mind of the infected believer and has now grown capable of exterminating the entire human race, along with a good portion, if not all, life on this planet. The state is even the enemy of those most dedicated to it. They are simply too blinded or too greedy to see this truth. In some people, the infection is so complete that they will willingly sacrifice themselves, their children, and everything they own and love for their precious, the state. Therefore, this is not an enemy to take lightly or to attack foolishly. Once we determine that our primary enemy is not a single person, 
It is not an institution, it is not a political party, and it is not capitalism or socialism, but it is a belief system that inspires millions of followers worldwide. Then and only then can we develop a successful plan to defeat it. That plan must first and foremost take into account our own strengths and our weaknesses, and determine the strengths and weaknesses of our enemy. Each of us must then decide our own role and weigh the individual price to engage this enemy. Only the fool begins to build a house without determining the cost and assessing himself to assure he can afford the construction. Only after accomplishing these steps we may engage our enemy on the field of battle that we choose with the weapons, timing, and rules that we choose. We expose ourselves to the enemy only in the way that we choose to expose ourselves. And then, when the fray is upon us, we must fight without mercy, without emotion, and with no thought of ever giving quarter or settling for any form of peace that doesn't include the complete death of our enemy, the state. Anything less, and this beast will simply regroup, shapeshift, and return upon us stronger than it ever has been. This is the nature of our enemy, the state. Chapter 2. Point 2. Point 1. Point 1. The Strength of the State. The story of the state can be understood by examining the story of the Lernaean Hydra of ancient mythology. The Hydra cannot be killed by a single decapitation, as it just grows more heads from the bloody stump of the last head. Its blood is so caustic that one drop will dissolve the best armor, and its breath will kill a strong man. Indications are that this, like the stories of the ancient Titans, was originally a folktale warning of the dangers of governments. The interesting aspect of this story is that the founders of the Greek states perverted this story to justify their bloody government regimes. In the myth, the gods brought forth the only person who could defeat the Hydra, that being the great hero Hercules. Yes, Hercules was the savior of humanity the same bloody Hercules that murdered his own family. As luck would have it, most of the ancient kings of the Greek cities just happened to be direct descendants of this great man, thus justifying the reign of each king, or so they told their subjects. This is how the state operates. When people come to realize what a hideous monster the government is, the state provides a great man as the deliverer. The great man destroys the monster and sets up a new government. That's why we need strong governments headed by a great man, Otherwise, there would not be a strong government headed by a monstrous beast. And yet, that great man is always the puppet of the true beast, the state. The state exists in the minds of hundreds of millions of faithful believers worldwide. Estimates are that there are currently some 350,000 humans born every day. That means the state can sacrifice vast numbers of believers and neutrals, see description below, without seriously weakening its base of existence. Additionally, a common belief among faithful state supporters is the idea that the earth is overpopulated. Whether true or not, the existence of state followers who not only believe this, but are also in positions of influence and authority, means that there are people with decision-making power who would be willing to exterminate unimaginable quantities of their fellow humans in order to keep the state alive and functioning. And their fanatical belief system demands such sacrifices, as has been clearly demonstrated throughout their history. When a sane, free-minded person considers the state under these terms, it's difficult to grasp the extent that those in power will go in order to maintain their power structure. However, when we think about the strengths of the state, this is the exact thing we must take into consideration. The state has no love of humanity. It feels no empathy. It is incapable of knowing fear. It thinks of humans no more than a virus thinks about its current host. Without blinking and on command, the faithful followers will throw the switches, lock the targets, and turn the keys that will incinerate cities full of people, sending poisonous waves of radioactive dust into the atmosphere to continue killing for decades. This is our enemy, the state. Such an enemy cannot be reasoned with, cannot be threatened, cannot be intimidated, cannot be bluffed, cannot be bribed, cannot be negotiated with, and will never stop until he dominates every single human or kills them all in the process. Such an enemy is willing to send any quantity of young foolish followers into battle to either die or murder waves and waves of both combatants and non-combatants alike. Such an enemy will round up millions for extermination on the hope of killing a handful in the resistance. This enemy sees with hundreds of millions of eyes, and any idea we can come up with has already passed through a hundred million of its brains. This is our enemy. This is the state. These are just some of the strengths of the state, but this list can continue. He has almost unlimited wealth. A stronghold cannot be built that he cannot destroy. Hiding from him is near impossible. He can touch almost every electronic communication. He has information about almost every human. He constantly seeks more details about everyone. And he will not stop so long as he has believers who love power. This is our enemy, the state. Chapter 2.2.1.2 The Weak Points of the State A child can crush the spider with his hands yet no king can possess a throne room that she cannot invade. 
An emperor can command a million slaves, and when he sleeps, she may walk across his brow. A president may order the destruction of cities, but he is not immune to her venom. In the dark corner, when the moment is right, her egg sacs open, and thousands of her children invade the palace. And there are more of us every day. The Federal Reserve in the United States and its IMF cohorts around the world provide the lion's share of the funding that our enemy, the state, uses to continue its dominance of humanity. The blockchain and her children, cryptocurrencies, are like millions of spiders spinning webs and moving about as they see fit, doing what they want, where they want, in spite of every effort to stop them. Some find the blockchain terrifying, some find her complicated, and some fail to notice her at all. She is a beautiful marvel if you see her with the right eyes. However, on her own, she is not enough to kill the beast. We must look further. Physical components of the state. Governments, central banks, crony corporations, the military-industrial complex, the mainstream media, and the mainstream entertainment industry all possess the same weakness in their structure. They are all based on collectivism, central planning, and constant internal power struggles to maintain order. The phrase dog-eat-dog was coined to describe their inner workings. The image of the snake swallowing its tail epitomizes the turmoil that is indicative of the components of the state. They are a serpent constantly devouring itself, a fake perpetual motion machine that always consumes its internal parts to maintain the illusion of functionality. On the physical economic level, the only thing that keeps this beast alive is the continuous stream of flesh, blood, and sweat harvested from the productive of the world and fed into the flames of its belly, and that internal turmoil is the weak point in the armor of the state where we must drive our lance. When you understand this weak point, you will see that it exists in every aspect of the physical components of the state. Chapter 2.2.1.2.01 Using the corporation as an example Many large corporations are incredibly delicate. Assuming the corporation is doing well, making money, and stable on its sector, there is a good likelihood it depends on government contracts, a government-provided quasi-monopoly, corporate welfare, or some other kind of government-provided advantage. In other words, the corporation depends on the political model of taxation, theft, and cronyism to survive. No matter its appearance of stability, if you look closely, you will see that the actual workforce has little to no motivation to work hard, strive to improve, seek innovation, nor function efficiently. The best workers are the few who show up to work every day, don't talk back to managers, and don't steal. The go-getter, the overproducer, is seen as a threat to his fellow worker, and sometimes even a threat to his slackered boss. The corporate boss on every level has a built-in motivation to keep the productive workers down the ladder in production positions while advancing the less productive up the corporate ladder. This is a well-documented phenomenon called the Peter Principle. Consider the following example. Supervisor Bob has 10 workers. He is one of five peer-level supervisors, each of which has 10 workers. So, 50 workers, 5 supervisors. Bob and his four supervisor peers answer to a manager named Tom, and Tom is one of five managers. Tom informs Bob and his peers that a manager spot is opened, and one of Bob's peers, Joe, has been chosen to move up. Bob is being considered as next in line to move up to manager. Tom tells Bob that Bob may choose one of the 50 workers to be the new supervisor replacing Joe. Does Bob select the top worker, knowing this new supervisor will compete with Bob for the next manager spot? Or does Bob pick one of the workers who is barely competent, so that the new supervisor will not outperform Bob and not be chosen to pass Bob, becoming the new manager? Of course, the answer is that Bob will likely choose someone who will not be a threat to Bob's advancement. Bob will not choose the best worker. Bob may even select the worst worker to replace Joe. Interruption. At this point in the example, the question becomes, why did Tom choose Joe to move up to manager? Did Tom pick the best supervisor, or did Tom pick the one he knew was barely competent so that Tom wouldn't be threatened in his next advancement? This is critical in understanding corporate structure. If you are confused or didn't follow this demonstration, please read it again or look up the Peter Principle and acquaint yourself with this phenomenon, because it is important to knowing your enemy. Now multiply this example over every level of the corporate structure from the janitorial staff to the board of directors. Add into the equation internal politics, jealousy, personal animosity, nepotism, and personal relationships. The final result is a business model that can only compete with other inept crony corporations. In an actual free market, unencumbered by government favoritism and advantages, such a business would quickly crumble. Once again, the above-described business structure is the pattern that the physical components of the state are all designed to function under. So, the underpinnings of the state, the feet of the idol as it were, are made of clay. Simple slacktivism in and of itself can be a tremendous threat to the stability of the beast. The great redemption in this revelation is that the truth of the above-described weakness of the state is already well known to vast numbers of state supporters. All we need to do is shine the light of mass system failure onto this flaw while providing a logical solution.
Chapter 2.2.1.2.02 The Corporation Stifles Innovation and Progress The following story is one example of the incompetence of the state and the vulnerability that it displays. However, this is just one example. With a little thought and effort, these flaws can be revealed in every product and service that the state, through its governments and crony corporatism, monopolistically force upon us. In the 1960s and 1970s, many respected construction engineers began speaking out against the use of overhead electrical transmission lines as opposed to underground lines. Although the topic remains debatable today, the advantages of underground lines are significant. They are demonstrably more reliable and safer, yet the utility companies were resistant to widely adopting the new method. Their primary reasons? Their existing infrastructure was committed to the overhead model, and installation of underground lines cost 5 to 15 times more than overhead. Those arguing in favor of underground pointed out that construction companies could be charged the price difference and simply pass the cost to the consumers through higher construction prices. These would be disproportionately covered by business rather than individual homeowners. However, the utility industry resisted and lobbied to stop local, state, and federal regulations requiring underground lines. In the background, and less obvious to the casual observer, was the fact that the powerful timber and coal interests were raking in a fortune selling creosote-injected wooden poles to the utility giants, and they were also lobbying against the underground utilities at the same time. Because of antiquated subsidies and regulations regarding the expansion of the electrical grid dating back to the 1930s, the utility companies had a tax-sponsored incentive to resist the underground method in favor of the overhead. So, as the utility giants expanded their electrical grid through the 1980s and 1990s, they stayed with the technology of the 1880s funded by laws of the 1930s, rather than adapting and modernizing to the current state of the industry. Remember the preceding paragraph the next time an ice storm or a hurricane leaves half a million Americans without power for a couple weeks. Now, think about what would happen if a small, dedicated group of fanatics decided to drive around the countryside with a rifle, taking out remote transformers. Such a situation would be uncomfortable in the southwest during the summer, but could be considered mass murder if it happened around the Great Lakes in February. And yet, isn't that what the state has done by incentivizing the overhead lines throughout regions that regularly suffer crushing ice storms? Some may ask, if the market is so great, why can't it provide a better solution than 1880s-style overhead wires or expensive trenching and underground lines? Late 1990s fuel cell technology using existing natural gas infrastructure demonstrated private ownership of generators could provide cheap, clean, quiet, reliable electricity to the new home construction in North America, adding roughly $10,000 to the sale price of each new home, but recovering that amount in utility cost savings, while virtually eliminating power outages. At the time, several small startup companies were competing to get these generators on the market. Please note here, these were not magic free energy machines, fuel cells are established reliable electric generators. Once sales of the fuel cells caught on in the construction market, projections indicated the cost of a home fuel cell generator may have fallen by 50% by 2002, making them widely available and affordable as a retrofit in the booming home renovation sector. Big energy companies saw the profit potential and began absorbing these small startup companies. But the potential for the consumer still seemed limitless. However, energy giants Enron, GE, Berkshire Hathaway, Moon Pickens Capital Management, and others clash in 2000-2001, resulting in the fall of Enron, the evaporation of incredible amounts of false capital, and the hope of energy-independent housing practically vanished, while continued mass dependency on the 1880s-style power grid was almost guaranteed for another generation due to the same factors involved in resisting the innovation of underground utilities two decades earlier. This example of corporate mishandling of technology could easily be seen as evidence of some grand conspiracy to control the energy markets. However, no conspiracy is needed to explain this tragedy. This is simply the way giant corporations and the existing capital management systems work. In theory, government regulators should prevent events like this from happening. However, the opposite is true. The history of modern banking, corporate regulatory practices, shows conclusively that this is exactly how the system is designed to function. This example provides an insight into two distinct and separate weaknesses of the state. The first weakness can be exploited through education and propaganda. Unfortunately, the Enron scandal is complicated, and as you attempt to explain it to the average state believer, his eyes will likely glaze over in boredom and disinterest long before your point can be made. If you're knowledgeable of the intricate details of this massive scandal, and if you have the skill set to tell this tale without your listeners dropping into a comatose state, you may be able to convince your listener that the whole corporate government system is designed to inhibit innovation while draining the maximum amount of wealth from the productive sector and funneling that wealth into the banking investment sector. Good luck with that, since the Enron scandal has been told over and over, with almost no one even mentioning the fuel cell aspect of the story. 
It may be easier to expose the flaw in being dependent upon the banking corporation government structure that provides the energy to your home that keeps your children alive during the winter. The promise from the state is that the state provides for us what the market by itself cannot. Not only is that a lie, the state actually provides a very unstable supply of overpriced energy. The energy grid is incredibly delicate due to the fact that it is the product of 135 years of central planning. It is rife with flaws, weak design, overburdened bottlenecks, and inefficiency. The power companies are riddled with corruption and stagnant thinking, and shackled by regulators that stopped making any sense 75 years ago, if they ever made sense at all. So we have this propaganda education opportunity, but only if it is explained correctly or demonstrated in practical terms. But who will listen, and why will they listen so long as the lights work? Thus we have the second weakness provided by this example. The state's power grid, while keeping the people of North America alive every winter, is incredibly delicate, and yet it is a source of faith in the existing system. Consider this. The Nile River was the source of life for old Egypt. If the Nile rises every time Pharaoh sacrifices to the gods, then every time the Nile rises, it proves the divinity of Pharaoh. However, if Pharaoh makes a sacrifice but the Nile falls, faith in Pharaoh weakens. If Pharaoh promises to solve the Nile problem but the Nile fails again, even after painful sacrifice by the people, more will question their faith in Pharaoh. Pharaoh's reaction will almost certainly be to double down on the sacrifice at the cost of the people. The lesson here is that so long as the evidence seems to support the state's narrative, the believers have no reason to question their faith. But when the system fails and fails again in spite of the state's efforts and promises, faith can be shaken. This is the single largest flaw in the armor of the state. It can't provide what it promises. We have electricity during the winter in spite of the state, not because of it. Again, the examples stated here are indicative of every product and service the state claims monopolistic right to supply. In every case, the state is vulnerable to a three-pronged attack, if that attack is done correctly. Prong one involves the careful infiltration of the manpower of the target. In other words, anarchists employed at the points of weakness. Friend saboteurs should develop a functional understanding of the infrastructure of their target. Controlled probing and testing provide information on target reactions and responses. Weaknesses are discovered and prioritized. Simple acts of sabotage harass the target while setting up a larger attack. During this time, the second prong of the attack begins to come into play, that being education and propaganda. Above-ground activists preach against the centrally planned state behemoth, warning that such structures are unstable and that society should not rely on something as undependable as the state. As the above-ground activists loudly predict disaster, the underground saboteurs provide the disaster. When the Nile fails and fails again and Pharaoh reacts with violence, increased confiscations and oppression, thus faith in the state weakens. And then... Eventually, the people begin to understand that there is no connection between the Nile and the state. The pharaoh and all his ministers are nothing but a violent gang of thieves. People stop making excuses for them, and they stop protecting them. At this point, the third prong strikes with precision and removes the human leadership of the state. Thus ends the war. It should be noted that the timing of the third prong is critical. If you strike too soon or are too obvious, you garner sympathy for the state actors. If you strike too late, you may miss the critical moment of vulnerability, and you may have to repeat the first two operations. It should also be noted that there can be no public connection between the friend saboteurs and the above-ground activists. The above-ground activists must consistently denounce sabotage or dismiss accusations of sabotage as crazy conspiracy theories concocted by desperate state actors to hide their incompetence. Do not miss this important point. When state actors blame anarchists for well-executed sabotage, above-ground activists can claim the statists are crazy conspiracy theorists. Finally, the third prong in this example should be recognized as the selective irregular warfare mentioned earlier. There should never be a public connection between selective irregular warfare and the above-ground activists nor the network of friend saboteurs. These must appear to be separate, unrelated entities. In best practice, there should never be an acknowledgement of the existence of the friend saboteurs, nor of the existence of the irregular warriors. Largely, their success depends on their invisibility. When done in one sector of industry, or one sector of the economy, or one geographical location, the above procedure can be damaging to the state. When coordinated to strike many actors at once, the truth of the state will be revealed for all to see. If done correctly, coordinated on a worldwide scale, this procedure will only need to be done once. The state is like a great colossus on a pedestal, made of steel and crowned in gold, but standing on feet of clay. It's not the job of the friend saboteur to melt the steel. After all, Molotov cocktails won't melt steel beams. It's only our job to make fissures in the clay. Gravity will do the rest.
Chapter 2, point two, point two. Are Human Enemies Fighting the government doesn't make you an anarchist. Some who fight authority do so only because they wish to have the power of the authority for themselves. There are as many flavors of enemies as there are enemies. It's important not to fall into collectivist thinking, either in the positive nor the negative direction. In other words, one should reject the idea of assuming everyone who fights a current government is a friend, just like one should reject the idea that everyone who is not a philosophically perfect anarchist is an enemy. Many people can do things that would seem to place them in the category of friend, but if they were to obtain the slightest political power, they would quickly become a more dangerous enemy than the ones currently in charge. Likewise, a person can take actions that would seem to flag them as enemies, but they are simply confused neutrals making bad choices. So before we label someone as an enemy, we have to be sure of their intentions. Also, in labeling an enemy, the input of multiple opinions is valuable. In short, be slow to judge, as this judgment can have deadly consequences. As important as it is to discriminate when we choose who to trust, we must discriminate when choosing who to condemn. Having said that, we must also reject some commonly held beliefs. It is often said, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. This old saying comes to us in modern times from the writings of Niccolo di Bernardo de Machiavelli, an Italian politician, diplomat, and philosopher. Basically, an advisor to our enemy. Not to say we can't learn from Machiavelli, we most definitely can. But Machiavelli was not writing from the perspective of ripping the prince down. He was writing from the perspective of keeping the prince in power. Machiavelli was advising a prince on how to behave in a way to maintain his monopoly on violence. That is the opposite of our design. Good advice for a prince is not by default good advice for everyone. We must be more like the spider mentioned in section 2.2.1.2 above. Ideally, we want to be near the prince, if possible, serving him a bowl of soup or driving him to his dentist appointment, but we should try to be in that position in a way that he doesn't notice we exist or doesn't recognize us as the threat that we are. As a general rule, the use of physical violence upon the person or persons of our enemies should be avoided by the friend saboteur. This is not a hard rule set in stone. It is guidance that should be taken into consideration when making that decision. This should not be taken to mean there should never be violence used against our enemies. It is simply stating that wisdom should dictate when to strike and what method will provide the best result. Eventually, there will be physical violence upon specific targets by those engaging in irregular warfare, but we won't be covering that in this section of this manual. For more on irregular warfare, see the publication Sedition, Subversion, and Sabotage, Field Manual No. 1, Ethics-Based Irregular Warfare. For our purposes in this section of this manual, we will classify three types of enemies that the friend saboteur should concern himself with. 1. Those who issue orders to rob, intimidate, cage, maim, and kill to maintain the state's murderous grip on humanity. These people should be our primary human targets when using simple sabotage. They may be high-level bureaucrats, politicians, military officers, judges, or high-level law enforcement. If it's possible to positively identify these shadow government actors, then they would be at the top of this category. Once again, as tempting as it is to resort to direct violence, wisdom must rule our actions. Our main goal is to disrupt their plans, distract their attention, and generally place Legos on the carpet of their life to keep them stumbling in the dark. Number 2. Those who choose to obey and execute above stated orders. These people are the front-line police, military, prison guards, mid-to-low-level bureaucrats, building inspectors, health inspectors, children's services agents, federal letter agency thugs, and every government actor that directly interferes with the public to enforce the arbitrary will of governments. These are individually our most dangerous enemies. They are the ones most likely to directly use violence upon the innocent. Number 3. Those who knowingly facilitate the order givers and the order executors. This is the widest group with the widest definition, therefore the most difficult to classify accurately. It includes mainstream media writers, personalities, and news directors. It's the corporate leaders that oversee the military-industrial complex, the central banking complex, and secondary workers in the prison-industrial complex. It's the mid-level government bureaucrats, the mid-level corporate dealmakers, the clergy that have sold their soul to the almighty state. It is the software writers, hardware developers, and hackers that betray the entire information technology sector while doing the dirty work for their state masters by facilitating the surveillance industry. In short, these people are the willful hands and fingers of the state. Chapter 2.3. Neutrals. The word neutral has its origin in the same word as neuter. Neuter is the castration of a male pet, and in the context of this discussion, that may be the best possible definition of those who are neither our friends nor our enemies. 
One of the most successful methods of the state throughout history has been to virtually neuter the bulk of the population, leaving them as little more than docile house pets. The most serious danger neutrals present to us is their tendency to bark and whine, alerting their masters as to our presence or our activities. Sometimes it's easy to confuse these Enochs with actual enemies, but it's important to understand the distinction. We must never aggress upon the neutrals. We must always keep in mind that they are the victims of the state. It is our job to set them free, not punish them for their lack of understanding. Never compromise this foundational principle. Rights do not depend on knowledge nor on understanding. Rights cannot be deemed a person based on ignorance. Therefore, we must always treat the neutrals as non-combatants and grant them the same respect as we do our friends. Their lives, their safety, and their property must be preserved and respected. Final thoughts on neutrals. As they are, many of us have been. As we are now, they may someday be. That said, neutrals can never be trusted. Never, so long as there remain neutrals, can they be trusted. Even after they awake, former neutrals should be carefully observed and tested. It's only as they prove themselves with small things that you may begin to trust them on bigger things. However, always use caution. The effects of the state can linger.